Today on X Play, prepare for the most controversial episode ever with our special one hour sex and violence explosion. We've got the ins and outs of pornographic games. These are the ones Mama warned you about. Plus, blood, carnage, and entrails scattered over asphalt like a mid-career Rauschenberg. X-Play's gonna turn your living room into a seething, breathing, killing floor of controversial content. Manhunt, GTA, COA, and more. This came out of nowhere. Get ready for a double shot of TNT and TNA with our unflinching look at the most controversial games in the history of video games. It's game time. Sex and Violence Explosion. Today's show is as chock full of dismemberments and genitals as you can possibly imagine. From the earliest days of Atari 2600 porn to the overripe grapefruit bosoms of DOA Beach Volleyball, we'll take you through the history of the baby making arts in video games. And we'll take a similar journey from Doom to GTA San Andreas through the viscerous splattered halls of video game violence history. And remember all the people, aliens, and farm animals we've killed over the years. Yes, now to get everyone squared away on just what video game events have offended and disturbed, we've put together a little primer to start off the show. Here's the history of controversy in games. Censorship. It's been there from the first pixel. Moving and maneuvering through lines of code. Sweeping through games. You think I'm such a naughty, naughty girl. The ragged earmarking of controversy. Censorship's firm hand of righteousness draws a line in the sand, only to have the waves of changing opinion come to sweep it away and start over again. Or in other words, we can now show you this. sweet, cathartic release. To find the origins of controversy, we must look beyond that first bloody splatter to a time where the printed page poisoned the youth culture. The Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency in the early 1950s was more spectacle than debate. Politicians up for re-election paraded around their pet psychologists. Men who never read a page determined the direction of expression for generations to come. The medium may have changed, but it's the rhetoric that endures. In 1994, video games were given the ESRB, an independent group that applies and forces ratings of all video games in the United States. From E to M and T for teen, the ESRB slaps on a list of naughty ingredients for proper consumer consumption. But some believe even this is not enough. Timber! As early as 2000, legislation started popping up around the country further restricting who can and cannot purchase games. Some were struck down in court, while others still stand. But a higher level has recently entered the picture. Members of Congress proposed a number of measures to protect the family by issuing restrictions on retailers, but not responsibility for the consumers. I am not afraid to fight. Controversy is the fuel of discussion, communication, the amniotic cesspool of ideas. I'm afraid of the end of the fight, the stagnant denouement of one extreme flaming victory. We both fight for the same thing, choice. The choice to tell the stories we want to tell. For me, there is no controversy. I just want to play a good game. Do not even think about it. Ever since the first cave paintings, human culture has hints on the ability of people to represent baby batter distribution in arts. Video games have been no exception, and even the earliest of consoles saw their share of ribaldry.
Many of you may have never heard of a distant galaxy called the 1970s. In that galaxy, an empire called Atari began making a gaming system called the 2600. Let's look at some third-party vintage trash Atari would like you to forget. Beat them and eat them. A rooftop assassin spryly takes aim at innocent pedestrians. Their mouths open in fear, screaming as colored, tinged ordnance plummet towards their saintly heads. The game was Custer's Revenge. The gaming element, if you say so. The setting, well, the spectacular vistas of the Monument Valley. A light-footed Custer, ever the human, that seeks to learn local dancing customs. That sound means two cultures have shared something special. What's a guy got to do to get a little action around here? A Night on the Town featured a perilous quest to lance your damsel that would take you under the watchful poop traps of bats and hot dog hungry crocs. Yes, that's a croc, and it's eating your tube steak. The game was Burning Desire. The scenario, incomprehensible. You're new, check. You're hanging from a helicopter, check. You're trying to put out a fire with your fertile issuance and convince this damsel to hold on to your pink microphone tightly. Avoid the gendarmes, Monsieur Lothario, and find yet another ever so desperate harlot awaiting your erotic engineering. Controversy comes in many forms, game fans, even ones that can barely be seen as games. <laughs> Oh, poorly rendered unspeakable act. It really makes you miss the Reagan administration. Speaking of unrepentant militarism, here's a look at the glorious pageant of destruction possible in electronic entertainment. the American Psychological Association published a paper finding that violent video games did cause kids to be more violent. But the study was extremely flawed, and it did note that parental intervention could counteract any inclination to violence engendered by video games. So what we're saying is that no one has established a clear link between violent video games and violent behavior. Yeah. In a moment. More sex and violence with the Glorious Globes for Lara Croft and Mortal Kombat on X-Play. Thank you, Adam and Morgan. As you can see, the city is at the mercy of the cop. Authorities do have a plan for beating off the cop, although details are not being made public at this time. It is definitely believed to be the biggest cock block of the war so far. Really? So a weakness has been found in the cock? That's correct. It's believed their heads and undersides are more sensitive, and this may be a key to bringing... Your parents, shouldn't you go out and... Welcome back to x -Play's look at the history of sex and violence in video games. Now, back in 1996, the world fell in love with a British archaeologist with a penchant for international travel and extremely short shorts. Over the years, she got a number of sequels, a few major motion pictures starring Angelina Jolie, and a series of Top Cow comic books. But throughout the series, the one constant, or should I say two, has been Lara's most significant asset. <laughs> In 1996, game maker Toby Gard dropped a double D atomic bomb on the video game industry. Tomb Raider starring Lara Croft. Although it was never explicit, the game made ways for having a female protagonist, a sexy female protagonist. Prior to the technological revolution, game characters weren't really able to show off their assets like Laura, but the ability to render models in 3D meant the gamers could admire her from every possible angle. 
feminist debated whether Laura was a kick-ass example of girl power or just another bombshell bimbo manipulated by geeky gamers. But serious controversy didn't hit until a handful of hackers found a way to alter the programming of Tomb Raider so that Lara Croft appeared in her birthday suit. The so-called Nude Raider patch hit the web in a big way, and the game's publisher had to send out cease and desist letters to protect their cover girl. But even without the ability to see Lara in the buff, gamers couldn't stop buying Tomb Raider. The series is one of the highest selling franchises of all time, and the original game has even been remade for current consoles as Tomb Raider Anniversary, despite coming out 11 years after the first game. Sorry guys, there's no nude code this time around. Back in the 90s, people weren't just getting up in arms about excessively large child sustenance devices, they were also opposed to killing whether in the darkened halls of doom or in the arenas of Mortal Kombat. Here's a look at two games that earned a lot of enmity for figuring out cool ways to kill folks. One of the most influential games ever written, id Software's Doom, is also one of the most controversial. Released in 1993, Doom's plot was simple. During a teleportation experiment, a gateway to hell is open. Demons spill through, kill everyone, and the task of repelling the monsters lands on you, the nameless Doom guy. One of Doom's networked multiplayer modes, famously known as Deathmatch, made annihilating your schoolmates and coworkers wildly popular. With its unrelenting violence, satanic imagery, and undeniable influence on gaming, Doom has proven itself to be one of video games' kings of controversy. What started as a small in-house project in 1991 began to relieve arcade dwellers of their hard-earned quarters in 1992. Using the digitized images of actors and gallons of pixelated plasma, Mortal Kombat combined realism and over-the-top gore in a way that only a mother could hate. Then, in 1993, born on the backs of Super Nintendo and Genesis consoles, Mortal Kombat headed into impressionable gamers' homes. So, next time you're at a game store and the clerk refuses to sell Gears of War to a little fella, because we all know that stores never sell M-rated games to little fellas, say a little thank you to Scorpion and company for eviscerating each other so compellingly, because the last thing we need are kids sticking grappling spears in each other's throats. Get over here. Mortal Kombat has branched out into other genres and added a third dimension to its original two but the effects of its launch can still be seen 15 years later. Now, the violence wasn't the only reason Doom was initially controversial. Back in 93, it claimed that Doom was the leading cause of lost productivity in American business. And the claim was well-founded. Intel, Lotus, and Carnegie Mellon University all had to institute policies banning the game, proving that while killing people may be distasteful to some, it's kind of addictive to many of the rest of us. Coming up, sexy co-eds and unparalleled carnage as we look at sex and violence in video games on X-Play. The High Def Format Wars take a new twist. The feed starts in 60 seconds. Hey guys, I'm Layla Kaylee. Paramount and DreamWorks Animation announced today that all future releases will be exclusively in HD DVD. The move is rumored to be driven by a $150 million exclusivity deal with the HD DVD group. This comes after Paramount began favoring Blu-ray releases with higher quality video encodings. The films Blades of Glory, Transformers and Shrek 3 will be the first titles to make the switch. In other news, MTV, Real Networks, and Verizon have joined together to form Rhapsody America. The online music service will also include ringtones, album covers, and music videos. No word yet on when the service is going to be available. Get more of the news you need to know at g4tv.com slash the feed. I'm Layla Cayley, and you've just been fed. we look at the history of sex and violence in video games. Our next title offers not only a slumber party full of sexy co-eds, but also a fair amount of carnage. Here's Night Trap.
You know, it's hard to imagine that something this hokey could have ever been considered controversial. But that's exactly the case with Night Trap. Originally released in 1992 for the Sega CD, Night Trap was one of the first games to combine live-action acting with terrible, terrible controls. In the game, you're tasked with protecting a group of teenage girls by activating traps in a house infested with bad guys. Our agents splice an override into the security system, allowing you to have control of the cameras and the traps with this remote unit. Great. Replacing the lives of five human beings in a Sega CD controller. That's why you're wasting time. Fortunately, you're aided by Dana Plato, who plays a spaced out undercover police officer. Somehow, she's convinced these high schoolers that she's one of them, so that she can tag along for the slumber party. We're going in. It's like 21 Jump Street for complete idiots. What's the first thing you think of? Party! So, why was this game controversial? Well, despite what you may have heard, it's never really all that explicit or violent. Instead, Night Trap got caught up in a pitfall of controversy because of its exploitative themes of violence towards women. In particular, this scene where a woman is called by vampiric baddies was considered particularly misogynistic, although by today's horror standards, it seems downright tame. Game makers pointed out that your goal was actually to defend the women in the mansion, but politicians weren't convinced. In 1993, a the Senate Special Committee criticized the game for being shameful and sick. It was even pulled off of store shelves and many retail outlets because of the controversy. Look at all the pretty girls. Is anything all right here? Yeah. <laughs> Night Trap and other violent games like Mortal Kombat led to the development of the ESRB rating system. And Night Trap was re-released for other systems with an M for mature designation. Although it's an important part of video game history, Night Trap isn't a particularly fun game. So, I wouldn't bother tracking down a copy if I were you. Until you figure out how to do your job, you're dismissed. Breaking contact. In addition to a significant role in the 1990 congressional hearings on video games, Night Trap was also pioneering for its integration of gameplay with live action footage. But it hasn't held up that well. Electronic Gaming Monthly once named it the 12th worst game of all time. In a moment, exploit, sex, and violence explosion continues with the executive producer of Scarface and a look at the ESRB on X-Play. What's that? That is the throne of agony. <laughs> Did you guys just glue a spike dildo to a chair? Uh, throne of agony? Yeah, whatever. Wanna sit on it? There are two very... Welcome back to X Play. Today we are examining sex and violence in games. And to give us a bit of perspective on how developers decide just how heinous to make a game, Adam's with Pete Winot, the executive producer of Scarface and the Chronicles of Riddick, to talk about violence in games. Thanks, Morgan. Well, Pete, thank you very much for joining us. Now, when you've overseen games like Riddick and Scarface, both of which, both of which have content which is both violent and some other edgier stuff that you find in Scarface, um, how do you approach that ahead of time? Is, is that, do you take that into account when you make the game that you want to have a limit on it? I, I mean, I think one of the things for us is we make sure that our studio partner, in this case for both Scarface and Riddick and the thing prior to that, was universal and really looked that is the violence level or the profanity level, does it match the original film? Is it you know true to the source material? And if it is, we try to match the source material bit for bit. So in Scarface, we want to have as many F-bombs as the film did. And since the film was prolific in terms of the number of times you know the main character said uh, you know, we want to make sure that in the game, that's reflective of that. Now, obviously, I think pushing the envelope is definitely the case of what's happening with Manhunt 2 and the ESRB's reaction. Um, is, is this the kind of thing that, that might give you some pause of what's happening now with reaction to violent content in video games? No, and I mean, I think the only problem with Manhunt 2 is that, you know, video games are sort of treated differently from films or books or music or poetry. Um, you know, really, it's a travesty that we as an industry don't come along and say to Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo, hey, look, you know, no matter what the content is, 
you should be able to put it out on that platform. Now, I can understand you don't want porn or stuff like that, and they have the right to that, but this is not the case for you know, Manhunt 2. I haven't played it, but I'm guessing it's not just a 12-hour you know, hardcore porn flick. Um, if it's violence or, and you don't like it or it's distasteful to you, so be it. Don't buy it. I mean, thank God that they would even try to get this game out the door. And instead of being, you know, a, a pariah to the industry, as industry, we should embrace it. I'm so happy that those guys, you know, made content and that they were had to be told, no, you can't put this out because it sort of marks it for everybody as a case of, look how unfairly this game is being treated. And don't treat this as, oh, this is Rockstar or Take-Two's problem. This is anybody who works in games or makes games for a living or who generates revenue from making games should be, you know, should call this out for being foul. So I think it's safe to say you're not going to let their decision out affect any decisions you make in the future. No, and I mean, look, we, we, look, we make games to, to, at the end of the day to generate money for the companies we work for. Um, we have to make sure that those games get published. We have to make sure they're on store shelves, but I mean, people should really, you know, rally to write letters to all the major console manufacturers, to all the major retailers, to go out and pre-order Manhunt 2 and say, you know what, F the establishment, we're going to go and support the art of video game making, because that's really what this is. All right, well, Pete, thank you so much. You're not just a uh, great producer, but you're also a great rabble rouser for the cause <laughs> of video games. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. All right, now to help you guys understand the video game rating system currently in place, here's a little primer on the ESRB rating system. The ESRB primer, from E to AO. E is for everyone, and they can tell you that it's true. From rolling balls to keeping pets, there's a lot that you can do. E10 Plus gives you just a little more before the sex and all the drugs. Not much more violence, but plenty of schoolboy nubs. T is for the teen, but you knew this anyway. With bunny girls with pretty boys and spiders that need a sleigh. M is for mature. Ah, my favorite one. With blood and blast and justice at the tip of every gun. AO is for adults, a game they can only view. Don't worry, though, doesn't happen much. There's only been a few. Beating hookers, killing chumps, never caused any harm. Flipping the baloney between the sheets, however, will set off the alarm. Well, there you go. That's all there is to the ESRB. So if you don't mind me, folks, I really have to go and do laundry. Why, you find something that rhymes with ESRB. One distinction a lot of people miss is that the ESRB isn't a government regulatory body. It's basically self-regulation by the industry. It's just an advisory system. Once you try to actually enforce a government ban on selling violent video games to kids, it becomes a First Amendment issue. And so far, all attempts to pass such a law have been overturned by the courts. Up next, X-Play's look at sex and violence in video games gets a little randier with Rumble Roses and the tentacle-filled world of hentai on X-Play. I guess that's me. This portion of G4 is brought to you by Break.com. Great flicks, hot chicks, and cool pics. Hey, hey. X Play Video Viewer Mail. Hey, Alan Morgan, this is a German agent for Chops Falcom. Do you think we'll ever see a mature rating version of uh, Man Up 2 on store shelves? Well, it's about to explain. To your question, Rockstar is going to have to do something. The violence in the game has already gotten it banned in Ireland and Britain, and it's probably going to get banned in Australia. Plus, an AO rating means you're not going to be able to get the game at Walmart, Best Buy, GameStop, essentially anywhere you buy games other than buying it online or going to an independent game store. So we're reasonably certain they're going to cut Manhunt 2 down to an F. But we should at least feel proud that we do live in one of the rare countries where banning video games based on content is the violation of our constitutional rights. And when an AO game does come out, we get to look at them. To return to the ever so controversial topic of human procreative organs, here's our tribute to the ladies of DOA Extreme Volleyball and Rumble Roses. <laughs> It 
It's always refreshing to see female characters portrayed as something more than princesses and fairies. Well, Roma Roses and DOA Extreme 2 do just that. Listen up, little girls. You can grow up to be anything you want to be, from a shapely nurse to a busty teacher. Miss Welsh might be a little naughty sometimes. Hell, someday you can even be a sexy devil cat woman if you put your mind to it. And if you're sad. Rumble Roses also dispels the myth that girl fights are all hair pulling and face porn. I mean, they're also full of leg spreading, head sitting, and mud wrestling. <laughs> but sometimes, a girl's just gotta dance. And yes, these ladies do happen to be quite blessed in the chest, but I'm sure they're very smart too. I must retrieve her post haste. She has missed far too many days of school. Now there's a fine message for the kids. Listen to your ample bosom teacher and stay in school. All right, so we know that Rumble Roses empowers women and promotes education, but what about the gameplay, you ask? Well, it sucks. But what do you expect? It's girls fighting. What next? Doing math? Parallel parking? And if you've had enough brutal cat fighting, but you just can't get enough of those lusty ladies, try a little DOA Extreme 2. It's all the bouncing, heaving fun of Rumble Roses, but without all the unpleasant game playing. Sure, there are games tucked away in DOA, but they can't possibly compete with the spectacular display of flying breath. The girls of DOA compete in lots of extreme competitions like popping, frolicking, and the ever-popular butt battle. Oh, and watch out for the victory jiggle. They'd go far from me. And when all the naked jet skiing gets to be too extreme, you can take a break, relax, and get back in touch with your inner peeping Tom. Take all the pictures you want without the threat of those pesky restraining orders. These games have a lot to offer, but it's mostly confined to bikinis and jumpsuits. What lovely, lovely ladies. But however dirty these games are, they can never compete with the tentacle-fueled world of Japanese pornographic games, manga and anime, known as hentai. <laughs> Its name means metamorphosis or strange. In art from the 14th century, slips today's technology a sensual cocktail from the Far East. So sit back and recline your morals as we saunter through the seductive realm of hentai erotica. Amusement so alluring, it'll make your hard drive sweat high karate. The succulent smells of stinging leather and broken wheels wafts through the... Wait, what the hell is this? Hentai games exploit the volatile combination of young men too afraid to talk to real women, but daring enough to ask a sales clerk for a copy of Do You Like Horny Bunnies? Well, do you? Static shots and ocular giganticism permeates the screens of these fetish games. The text not only goes through meaningless banter, but also reminds, just in case you forgot, that you are still horny. I thought this was just a terrible Carmen San Diego game. I mean, I already found the loot in the warrant. Other games try to tack on an action element as you await the drop of that burning, craggy mass into a delicate, quivering sea of lust. Well, because that's what literally happens in the game DBVR. Set in a future where cops don't require pants, aiming skills, or an intact hymen, the game quickly turns into a make-your-own-girl affair. Always check for missing pieces. Huh, I think that came with a different model. Seriously, is this what other guys like? Sure, we added in the sound effect, but I can't even begin to explain how wrong this is. <laughs> Finally, we make it to 3D hentai, a game so horrific, this is all the sensors will allow. The rest you can only speculate through a heavy sheen of pixelation. I mean, we're talking about acts so depraved, Prince wouldn't sing about it. So, there you have it. Just because it's made to entice the throes of youthful lust doesn't mean that the game needs to be good or playable. Now, if you will excuse me, my eyes have a hot date with a bottle of Clorox. A few moments ago, we were talking about the rock star game Manhunt 2, which has been banned in a few countries due to the violence. Now, the original was pretty violent itself. Here's our look at the controversy stirred up by the original Manhunt. <laughs> Banned in Australia. The Kiwis put the kibosh on it. Verboten in Germany. What is it that the rest of the world doesn't want you to see? Why, it's manhunt. 
course. No, not the online dating service for consenting gentlemen. I made that mistake too, and believe me, was I embarrassed. This is the controversial video game in which you play a happy-go-lucky convict who's forced to participate in the creation of snuff films. by Rockstar Games, Manhunt is a run-of-the-mill stealth game with a twist. Like a 16-year-old at Hot Topic, it's dark and violent and desperate for attention. Come on, you bunch of f***ing pansies! Most infamously, Manhunt was linked to the murder of a 14-year-old boy in the UK. Although initial media speculation focused on the killer being influenced by the game, it was later revealed that it was the victim who owned a copy, and the murderer had never even played it. As entertainment, it hardly lives up to the hype that surrounded it. The plot is your standard fare. You play a prisoner broken out of jail by a director with a taste for the macabre who forces you to be the star of his latest movie. All you have to do is sneak around Carcer City at night and kill hundreds of kooky gang members. Wait a sec. Let's try to defuse the tension here. A little Tchaikovsky should do it. <laughs> After even a short time playing, though, the deaths lose their shock value, and the initial sense of exhilaration you got from watching those first few murders is long gone. In the end, Manhunt's biggest crime isn't that it inspired a wave of copycat killers across the world, but that it failed to deliver the goods we all wanted, an exciting, mature game that does more than titillate without satisfying. It's what you used to paint it for. All the sex and violence isn't in the past. New advances are being made in the killing and doing it arts every day. So to get all the freshest, newest reviews of violent, sexy video games, be sure to come to g4tv.com slash podcast or iTunes and sign up for our podcast. In a moment, X-Play Sex and Violence Explosion continues with Grand Theft Auto and some extremely hot coffee on X-Play. I want to prove it to myself. I'm going to take a game that looks boring and lame, and I'm going to spin it and turn it into something entertaining and fun to watch. I'll show you. I'll show everybody. I'm going to make the best review ever out of that game. In the world of... I don't even know where home is anymore. Covering live events for G4 means living out of a suitcase. The Tokyo Game Show is insane. That myth about vending machines filled with used panties, not a myth. CES Live from Vegas, yes, but my last five meals have come out of the mini bar and I can't get my hands on an iPhone or a booth babe. At Comic-Con, a dwarf drinks my producer under the table and steals our gear. We have to borrow a camera from a stormtrooper to make our live broadcast. This year, E3 is closed to the public, but thousands are pushing to get in, and then Olivia reminds me. Kev, this is G4. We can go anywhere. Welcome back to X Play. Now we're looking at the history of violence and sex in video games today. And if we're looking for sex and violence, you know there's going to be some GTA in the show. Honestly, I don't see why everyone seems to have such a problem with Grand Theft Auto. Come on, show me what you got. I mean, seriously, what's the big deal? Hello, that's my. Basically, it's just a driving game. What could possibly be so controversial about that? When it comes down to it, some games are just doomed to controversy right from the start. For example, Grand Theft Auto. <coughs> the premise has always been a simple one. Steal a car, steal another car. Kill someone, then steal yet another car and use that to kill someone. Oh, and then go buy outfits. I had porn for breakfast. What's in a name? Well, when it comes to controversy, everything. It's no wonder GTA raised hackles from the beginning. Its nom de plume refers to a serious felony offense. No one even has to have played the game for the bad seed labels to start flying. Kind of like that Ice T song, Cop Killer. I mean, that wasn't even really about killing cops. Right? Which leads me to my next point. You have the option, nay, the right, nay, a responsibility to kill a lot of people in this game. And that's a huge part of what makes GTA such a pariah. Look at those drones, people. Oh, you think you tough? 
you're not only encouraged to violently kill at will, but you have the free will to kill whoever you want. Civilians, cops, soldiers, and anyone else who stands in your way. Or doesn't, for that matter. The glorification of crime and its tendency to place criminal figures on a pedestal makes the GTA franchise one that will always be controversial. Time to put away the double ender. But look at it this way. The more of them that are released, the more we get to drink from the sweet, sweet cup of desensitization. If nothing else, it's the only place you'll ever get to see this happen. Thanks, Grand Theft Auto. Your wonders are truly boundless. Well, the GTA series has made quite a mess of controversy for itself over time. Few things were as significant as the discovery of vestigial code in the PC version of the game, where you could go upstairs for some sweet, sweet coffee and get a side order of pie along with it. You know, it's kind of pie, I mean. Won't someone think of the children? That cry went out across the land in 2005 when a new minigame was discovered for GTA San Andreas. I'm talking about the infamous Hot Coffee Mod, available only as a black market download across the interweb. Hey man, you got any San Andreas mods? Man, be cool, be cool, dog. There's fuzzies all around. I got it right here, dog. Just don't forget we got it for Pump it. Yeah, all the back. In the original unmodded version of gameplay, CJ never gets past first base on screen, but with hot coffee, take your lady out on a hot day to vehicular manslaughter, a few beers, she'll invite you in. How about a little coffee? It's a rhythm game. You've got to keep the right pace to increase the uh, excitement and ultimately win the mini game. CJ, that was amazing. Uh, uh. As you can assume, the ESRB launched a massive investigation into hot coffee. <laughs> but when the voice acting and animation matched the rest of San Andreas so perfectly, I ain't insecure, but tell me I'm great. It became apparent that the minigame was content created for San Andreas that was made unavailable before the game's release. For now, we can only wonder what might remain secreted away in the cavernous depths of Grand Theft Auto and Andreas. Go away, I ain't in here. Honest. In 2005, Rockstar released the so-called Cold Coffee Patch, which, in addition to fixing a bunch of bugs in the game, also disabled the Hot Coffee minigame. Nobody likes cold coffee. Moments away, the sex and violence explosion continues with our look at the future of censorship on X-Play. Damn it, you useless sex Excuse me, that's not my boyfriend. That there is a soused penis support system. But I turned back time. I mean, I played my ocarina. That wasn't an ocarina, you dumb f You blacked out with my diaphragm in your mouth. We're serving up a hot steaming bowl of Code Monkeys. Dude, I just dropped a deuce in the brownie bowl. Code Monkeys is coming up next, only on G4. and violence explosion. Morgan's got George Jones, the editorial director of Game Pro Magazine, on satellite to talk about self-censorship and regulation in the gaming industry. Hi, George. Thanks so much for being with us. Okay, so I think a lot of gamers think of the ESRB as mainly a rating system to help parents learn more about what video games they should or shouldn't get for their kids. But I think lately we're seeing the ESRB actually influence developers. Is this true, and, and how are they doing that? The SRB wields in, you know, a very large amount of power, and we're seeing that happen with, in the case of Manhunt 2, for example. I mean, they are, that game is going to change fundamentally because of the SRB's notion that it's AO content. 
Um, another couple of examples are the things that are going on online with Oblivion. The, the notion that people can get in and hack these games is, is creating some interesting ramifications for the whole industry in terms of what kind of content we're producing. Is that going to influence the kind of content that we're going to be able to see in video games? You open it up to users and obviously there's going to be one dude who's going to put a swastika on the car. Do you think that's going to have an influence on video games? Uh, the notion of free speech is very important and it's, it's scary to think that a group of people, a group of three people specifically, can land on this kind of content and, and erase it or, or demand that it be pulled. At the same time, I think there's a certain amount of sensitivity that we all want to have. We want to live in a world that's considerate. Um, I think what's going to end up happening is there's going to have to be some way of judging content that's user created that's not done by a group of people but by the community itself. Um, so the ESRB, I can imagine a situation where the ESRB basically says, hey, you know, for game X, here's our rating, and then for the online element, they maybe defer to the community or the publisher itself. But do you think the publishers are going to prove to be responsible enough to, you know, regulate their own content? Yeah, you know, the publishers are scared to death of the SRB, that's for sure. And, you know, I think it's just one of those situations where they're going to always have to kowtow to this organization. Um, but I guess it's better to be safe, right? But at the same time, censorship is nothing to be taken lightly. I mean, it's interesting to think that the community would be responsible enough to censor uh, content that they found offensive. I just wonder if gamers will be responsible enough to do that themselves. If the publishers aren't necessarily responsible enough, will gamers be responsible enough? For me, that's a much more acceptable way to handle questionable content than a group of people that I don't know. I don't know who they are. I'm, I'm going to bet that they're not. It's not a very diverse group. Um, it's just, for me, I'd rather have it be done at the community level, but I understand it's not necessarily feasible. So can you tell me just a, a quick two-sentence um, understanding of who the ESRB is exactly? You were saying that it's a very small number of regulators. Okay, yeah, they're an organization that enforces the ratings. Um, as, as far as I know, it's three people. Um, they're supposed to be from diverse backgrounds. They, they look at video of the game, and then they determine what its rating is, and that's it. And that's it. Well, hopefully gamers will have more control over this in the future. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Morgan. Now, in a world constantly changing, one can only imagine the potential future of sex and violence in video games. So, we've imagined it. <laughs> What are some of the new ways games will be pressured to alter its content? What are some of the ways games are being pressured right now? Take The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, for example. Bethesda had this game packaged and ready to ship with an ESRB rating of T for Team. Along comes an enterprising jester with a passing knowledge of code manipulation, and suddenly a character in the game has been relieved of its Dark Ages everyday wear. Big deal, right? I mean, she looks like a confused grad student caught up in an initiation at the Fluid Dynamics Lab. What happened was, the ESRB were made aware that someone had created a mod that removed the character's clothes. They reevaluated the original rating based on something that wasn't Bethesda's fault. The new rating would be an M. Rockstar's Manhunt 2 may just share the fate of one of its own characters. The ESRB has decided to use Manhunt 2 as an example slapping it with a rarely seen adult-only label, effectively killing its distribution for the time being. By going after Manhunt 2, the ESRB wants Rockstar to hear that loud and clear. Game developers are now being coerced in terms of what they can show through their ability to market the game. Yet an AO is a financial death sentence right now. What about titles where users are given the freedom to design their own gaming elements, like Forza 2? Trick anything you want, hearts, paint, and personality are all at your disposal. This car, for example, we can't show it to you because it's covered in human reproductive organs. In this situation, who gets penalized? The person that made the paint or the painter? The megaphone or the kid yelling into it? Games like Little Big Planet and Spore will all have a wide open ability for the user to take part in game creation factors. How will the SRB react? Will they go after your expression by levying pressure on the game companies that gave it to you? That seems to get pretty close to having to justify imagination itself. Well, we can speculate. You guys are the game developers, the game producers of tomorrow. It's your obligation to put as much head-exploding violence and, well, head-exploding sex as you can into video games. So the Joe Liebermans of tomorrow will have something to complain about. Thank you for watching X-Flight.